Purely for your willingness to participate in uh, our conference. Very glad to do it. Fine, thank you. This conference explores the hidden, ongoing extraterrestrial influence on our world, especially positive, but for the sake of verification, it also touches upon the negative. What are your thoughts and ideas about this matter based on your personal experience? Okay, um, since the 1970s, when I started to have sightings, the time I was a kid, I I thought that we were probably being visited by intelligences from outer space. Now, um, at the age of 17, 18, I got closer to the Rama Group Network of Contact, and through them, I had the first collective sightings. Um, with a group of 15, 20 people, I started to have the sightings in um, Chilka Desert. Uh, I remember one of the first sightings I have with the group uh, leave me a, a feeling that I could not uh, put in words. It was just uh, inside of me. Uh, a month later, I took my brother to the desert, and he got the same experience. He had a big sighting in the desert, and he told me, at last, he put in words what I just could feel. He said, I felt like God was closer to us. And I, I knew exactly that that was the feeling I had in the beginning. It's not that we think they are um, gods for us, but the fact that they are traveling so far to be closer to us, to share a message of hope, uh, that makes me feel that God is closer through them. So I think the experience of contact is a positive one. I think they come here, at least the ones we contact through Rama, they come here with a good intention. They are uh, focusing their attention in um, helping us through this uh, path of evolution we are going through, through all the changes we are going through. Um, with Luis Fernando Mostajo, who was uh, with you before, um, we talk about this, uh, how these alien beings maybe are looking at humankind as teenagers. In the stage we are, we are a little bit um, suicidal, crazy, rebels, but these alien beings are very patient. They are uh, looking at us, uh, waiting for the right moment to, to give advice, to guide us, even to protect us against our own uh, negative impulse sometimes. So I think they are already interacting with humankind, maybe not in the way we would like to expect, because many people and in the movies we see this interaction of these beings with the government, right? They come and interview the president, but they don't see us with those um, um, scales or hierarchies. What they see is a, a whole a common group of people, and I think they are more willing to contact the regular inhabitant of our world than an authority. Because our authorities, in a way, they are focusing their attention on a fragment of the population, and they don't represent the whole. When these alien beings come, they represent a whole system right there. And when they come down, they find us fragmented, separated. So an authority in this planet, uh, a president, a governor, cannot represent the whole population. And I think that's the main reason they contact the regular uh, inhabitant, the regular people. I think they come with good intentions, at least the ones that contacted us. But I also think that there are many different races visiting the planet and probably some of them don't have the same interest. Maybe they have different agendas. Maybe they come here to explore as a scientist. The same we do with uh, animals in Galapagos Island. We take the turtles, we put some tag with a number, we classify the species. Maybe there are some species out there that look at us with the same disrespect uh, from our view, right? 
maybe they are trying to protect their species. But you see the agendas are different. And I think the ones that contacted us through the Rama network, they are uh, people with a very high standard of how to contact. The protocols are very specific, and they are really trying to protect the planet. And um, I think they are doing it. Hi. Thank you. How did your first contact on the boat tell us about your initial experience with the extraterrestrials? How, it's, how it all started for you, for you? Sure. The first sighting was when I was seven years old in Lima, the capital of Peru. I had a sighting with all my friends outside in the block. I, we were playing uh, the football soccer and then suddenly in the middle of the night we saw this light on top of us running at high speed and with such a bright light that the night became day. Um, days later, another sighting, um, this time um, it was witnessed also for many adults and that I think triggers my curiosity about these matters. Um, about the, when I was 12 years old, I started to have a spontaneous uh, astral projections. I separated from my body when I was sleeping and I traveled to different places. It was something that in the beginning I didn't control. Later on I learned through meditation and, and different um, uh, systems of knowledge how to control this uh, ability. And through that, I had some encounters in the astral plane. But then, uh, one day I received an invitation through the astral experience to have an encounter with them. And at the same time, in the news, I realized the Rama group was going to have uh, an encounter in the Chilka Desert. At the time, I was not with Rama. I was uh, barely 17, I think. And I decided that I was going to participate of that experience because if I was invited through the astral experience, I thought that was going to be the physical encounter I was expecting. When I went to the Rama group, they reject me. They said, you don't have the even a year of preparation with us. You cannot go with us to the desert. Um, anyways, I find my way into the desert and I, I look for them. I couldn't find them. Uh, I got lost in the desert. When I went back to Lima, uh, there was a huge blackout, the energy of the city was gone, and that night I had a big uh, experience in the astral, meeting two beings, and they gave me a lot of information about our solar system and the bases they have in different satellites of our solar system. And through that, I decided that I was going to get closer to the Rama group. I needed to to be with a network of people that believe in this stuff and also share the same information. And I was feeling alienated with my regular group. The people of my blog, my friends from childhood, they, they could not share the same interests. So I looked for the Rama network and I started participating with them. And in a preparation of maybe six weeks, uh, I went to the to the desert and I had that first sighting with a group, about 15 people. We saw this uh, like thick mist advancing at the level of the mountains, and then from that mist, many uh, objects, uh, bright objects, first information, then moving different ways, maybe zigzagging in the sky. That was the first sighting in group. Later on, I decided that because we were the youngest in Rama. We were kids between 15 and maybe 25. Uh, we didn't have the experience and the antenna. Terja mentioned before that in Rama, we have this person that has the telepathic ability to connect with the aliens. That we call antenna. In our little group, we didn't have that. So I decided that I was going to practice. I was going to try the, the receiving of information through the telepathic means. And I practiced with just a simple pen and, and paper one night at 11 p.m. 
I relax, uh, close my eyes, uh, open my mind to it. Nothing happened the first night. Second night, I did the same. I felt this weird energy running down my spine and my body, uh, but nothing around me. I didn't feel anything special. The third night, I said, if nothing happened, I'm going to quit this thing. It's not going to happen through me, maybe someone else. And I was with my pen and paper ready. Suddenly, I felt this energy running again through my body. And then the presence of someone in the room. And I turned around. I couldn't see anything. I closed my eyes again. Then I felt and I saw in my mind these hands approaching from the back. The hands were behind. But I could see them clearly somehow. And then energy coming from the palms of the hand. It was like a running energy. It runs with a vibration. I could hear it through my ears like and with the third vibration, it was like an explosion of light in my forehead. And suddenly, this being was standing in the other side of the table. He was about maybe one meter, 85, 90 centimeters, very tall guy. His body was um, very muscular. He was wearing like a robe that was uh, very thin, close to the body, in a way that I could see how um, it draw the, the muscles in the shoulders. And very well proportioned, like a gymnastic guy. And his hair was long, white, um, high cheeks, uh, big eyes, but not in the sense of, of those eyes you see in the movies, black. And No, they were... More human eyes, but a little bit uh, bigger, maybe. Like a Mongol, maybe. And his face was very harmonious in the expression. Around his body, there was this uh, light uh, that surrounds his body. It was not an aura. It was something else, very close to the, to the skin and surrounding the whole body. And... I remember I was shocked. I was very afraid. I didn't expect that. I was expecting more like a voice in my mind. But suddenly the guy was standing there. And the silence was so strong that I thought I was going to collapse. My, I could hear my heart. And then I remember breaking the, the silence with a question. I asked him, are you going to say something? Are you going to dictate something? I'm ready. I have my pen. And he, he was just standing there and then he smiled and I felt this kind of like energy coming from him and that energy embraced me. I couldn't see it, but I could feel it. And the feeling was translated by my pain into little brother because the feeling was a feeling of brotherhood of a loving brother and my brain immediately translated that and i realized that telepathy was not the transmission of thought but also emotion and my brain obviously it translate into language. In that case, it was Spanish. I'm sure if at the time I would have speak English, probably I would have heard in English too. But uh, the communication continued in that way. He felt something and then my mind uh, organized the ideas. And he was telling me that he had the need to come down because I was not the antenna of the group. At the time, I didn't have the ability to channel this energy, this information. And he told me there was one person in my group that was ready for it. And he told me that every time that I predisposed myself to the experience in representation of my group, they were going to be ready to approach me, to give me the advice I needed. But right now, the necessity of the moment was for me to go back to my group and tell them what happened and explain how I did it. So the one that is ready to receive the information was going to be awakened. And this person was my friend, Victor Benitez. He was, he was a guy who was part of the group, very shy. He was quiet most of the time. But when he heard my story, 
he uh, became so intrigued, so curious that he started practicing the the same modality with pen and paper. And days later, he opened his channel and he started receiving information. He was the antenna of the group. I wasn't. Well, when the alien said that, uh, that I was not the antenna, um, I remember I had so many questions, but at the time I was completely blank. I tried to search in my mind, but my mind was completely clear and relaxed. I didn't have any fear anymore. I felt so uh, at peace in his presence that I would have liked the, the sent to, to last longer, but when he realized I was not going to say anything else, he just smiled at me, and the light that was surrounding him started, started to shine brighter, and then the whole image of his body uh, shrink in middle air. Like when you turn off those old TVs in black and white, when you turn it off, the whole image goes into a spot. It was something like that. His whole image just shrink and disappear in the middle of year and I, I couldn't believe my eyes I was so excited and afraid and all the feelings all together that was the first uh, time I had a meeting with one of those beings you think that he projected it was a holographic projection since it disappeared that way um, that's a very good question Sergei. I'm, I'm not sure if that was holographic or any other thing honestly I, I didn't ask it, and I know they have uh, control over our matter that goes beyond our comprehension. So I couldn't tell you if he was physical at the time or it was a holographic. I know we have the tendency to interpret that as a holographic projection because it, it responds to the characteristics of the holographic experience we have. But I, I couldn't tell you that it was a yes or a no. Honestly, I had some other experiences when I can hold the hand, I could feel the hand of them. And even though they were physical and felt by my experience, even at that time, I couldn't tell you it was physical or not. Maybe not physical in our sense. Okay, thank you. You're going to go with more on it. Italy into Mission Rama. The contact mission called Mission Rama started in the Chilka Desert outside Lima in 1974 with a contact made by the Aswell's brother with the individual called Ox Oxalk from Ganymede. Over the, year, it, over the years it has spread to many other countries in South America as well as to the US and some countries in Europe. According to my information, 49 extraterrestrials called guides were involved, coming from Venus, Serbian 2 in the constellation Canis Majoris, and Apu in Alpha Centauri. We also know that Sixto Paswells officially disbanded Mission Rama in the beginning of the 90s. Still, there are Mission Rama groups today. Can you please clarify the present situation? And B, are all the ET guides? Is Itigard still involved in this mission? Okay, um, Rama used to be uh, a group that functioned through a structure. They tried to, to give a legal um, backup to the group in the beginning. But then there were people in the group that tried to, to make it look like a new, new vault or region, and there was never the intention of it. And because of that, I think the guides, the extraterrestrial beings, uh, realized that we were deviating the, the information into something else. So they decided that they were going to shift a little bit the way we, we manage things down here. And they suggest to Sixto in the 1990 that the group uh, was not anymore um, a legal structure but a free way of sharing this information. And just months before Sixto received that uh, telepathic communication, I also in meditation received the same thing that 
Rama shouldn't become a, a religion because in a way religions uh, are separating ideologies and they didn't meant their message to, to do that. And they told me in that meditation that we should spread the word freely. So when Sixto opened up about this, for me, it was no new. I accepted immediately, even though many of the members of the Rama Network rejected the idea. Anyways, uh, Sixto uh, did the step and many groups felt like they didn't have a direction in the beginning. But then with all the information we received through the years, it was easy to continue. Um, not in the same way, but now people freely started to make groups of affinity, people share the same ideology, the same feelings towards the contact, and they start meeting in different countries. And, and then Rama continue, just with a, without the mask of uh, being this structure, this group, this selected thing. It was never meant to, to be that. So Rama is still here. I think Rama, more than what we observe here in the surface of the planet Earth, Rama is a program of contact. Um, whose initiative comes from up there. So we have to accommodate to the initiative and the protocols they have. Uh, most of the times, they are the ones that look for the contact. It is not very common that we open our mind and they come. It happens, but it's not very common. Most of the times, it's their initiative. They know the right moment and the right place to to trigger the experience. Of course, if we predispose ourselves, if we open our minds, they are going to be willing to, to approach us. Yeah. Uh, so Rama is still working. And I think we should review the, the final objectives of the group, because I think through the years, we have the tendency to forget that. And in the middle of October, I'm going to Mount Shasta with a group of, of Rama, Rama members, and we are going to discuss about the original objectives that we received in the 70s, and we are going to talk about uh, how uh, we can still follow those objectives, or how did they change through the years, how we understand them now, after 40 years of, of contact. So that's how I see the, the group of contact now. Okay, thank you. What would you say was, or perhaps is, the most important message given to us by our space friends, or to you, by your space friends in Vision Rama? To me, I think is what they call the, the shift of humankind the jumping into a new state of consciousness. And I said that to me, because Rama has many objectives, and I noticed through the years that many of my friends, other members of the group, they gave attention on different aspects of the contact. But one of the things the alien, the extraterrestrial being says, is that humankind was ready to jump into the fourth dimension of consciousness. And in the beginning, I didn't care about it. I was just there to have the sightings and to have the meetings with the aliens, to have the experience. But then in 1990, I quit the group. I decided that I didn't need it anymore. I was going to live my life. I had my studies in the university. Um, so I decided to get away from the group. And at that moment, it happened to me that this level of consciousness they were talking about for so long suddenly engulfed me. It happens uh, spontaneously. And for four days, I had the experience of what they call the fourth dimension. Um, it's very difficult to understand because our language describes only the third dimension. So when you try to point at something that is outside of time or your consciousness functioning in a way that present is 
expansive and you, you don't have the right words to, to describe that. But I can tell you that all the, the powers that the metaphysical studies talk about, um, clairvoyance, uh, telepathic abilities, uh, intuition, all those things are actually natural in human beings. It's just that we are not in the right environment. Um, what I experienced in those four days is that the fourth dimension of consciousness is uh, a potential that we are going to achieve as a group. The whole humankind is going to do the jump. And actually, in 2012, uh, this potential reached his highest point. So we, I think, already entered that space, that, that kind of consciousness. And we are not experiencing it because our senses are so accustomed, so used to the old paradigm that we are not ready to see what is new. We are still blind vibration that is already with us. In those four days in the 1990s, for me, it was completely new. It was like someone pushed me into the pool and suddenly I have to swim. I have to, to develop this, but it was so natural. And I was sure that all of us, the whole humankind is gonna, is gonna jump into that stage. And for me is the most important thing because I know that will point in a different direction for our evolution. That will, that will really uh, give us a, a blueprint of where we are going and that we are gonna achieve through that. Um, I think the idea of the fourth dimension of consciousness, the, the activation, formation in us, for me, is, is the most important thing. Yeah, thank you. What is the most important work to do on ourselves in order to prepare us for contact with the benevolent extraterrestrials? Are there any specific techniques or procedures that you would recommend in order to hide our vibration, so to speak? Yes. Um, meditation is a plus. If you really want to expand your consciousness in order to, to have this contact, you need to practice meditation. Because as you calm down uh, your regular way of thinking, you expand and grow in the other side you don't know of yourself. And in that space, you're going to find them. Their mind and yours are already linked, but you need to quiet your, your regular mind, your normal self, your cultural conditioning. You have to stop that in order to, to recognize the link that is already there with them. Meditation helps a lot with that. Uh, I think if you meditate regularly every day with the intention of contacting them, they eventually will approach you through meditation first and maybe through dreams later and later on probably a sighting and who knows, maybe you can go even beyond that. But I think meditation is A+. plus. You really need to meditate and practice. I don't care what modality of meditation, just meditate, quiet your regular mind and and you will find a way to, to approach them. Now, another thing I notice is that um, we need to, to function with the heart. And I think that's very difficult for us because our society trains us to, to function at the speed of the brain. Um, it's like this. Uh, I want all the people in the audience to interlace the fingers like that. Can you do that? Yes, interlace the fingers. Did you do that? Okay, notice the ones that have the left on top of the right. Lift your hands. That was the left on top of the right, right? 
that's very good because that means that you are functioning or trying to function from the heart. Um, most of the people interlace the right on top of the left. That means the function of the brain is on top of the heart. Okay, because we are wired that way. This hand is closer to our heart. Now, why am I telling you this? Uh, most of the people are actually working at fast speed. They are being pulled by the ideology of our culture, and we don't stop. It's one experience after the other, and we, we are never having the time to just breathe in and feel our state and feel others around us. When you are trying to get in contact with them, it's not just your brain, it's not just ideas, it's your feelings too. So as much as you function at the level of your feelings, you're going to have a bigger awareness of their approach. I've noticed when I go to the field, to, to the mountains or the desert, when I want to send a message from my mind, maybe nothing happened. But if I focus on my feeling, and then I see this light growing in my chest with the feeling of brotherhood, and I want to contact them, I want to get close to them, and then I send this energy to my brain. And I see the light combining, and then I just uh, shoot this beam of light into the space with the message of uh, get close to us, we are ready for the contact, and then it happens. So you see, it's not just your ideas and your thoughts. You have to combine your emotion too. So that's what I do, and I'm sure if you use it, you are probably going to have the experience. At some point, I was in the mountains here in uh, Pasadena, um, and I was with a friend who asked me about the sightings, and I said, they are always looking at us. We have to predispose ourselves to open ourselves for the experience. And she told me how to do it. I said, well, shoot a beam of light from your head and blah, blah, blah. And then she tried it, and it didn't work. And I said, oh, I forget. You have to do it from your heart. And then she did it, and then we have a big sighting in the middle of the mountains in Pasadena. And she was shaky and, and very excited about it. And that's the way it works. They want to contact your whole being, not just your ideas, not just your brain. They want to contact you in many different levels because you exist in many different levels. You exist not only in the third dimension, you exist also in the fourth dimension of consciousness already, even though you cannot sense it yet. Train yourself for the expansion, train yourself for the experience of the new, and then you will be going beyond your comfort zone into the experience of the new, to the magical field where many things can happen. Fine, thank you for a very good explanation. This with a, with a hat on the horse. That was excellent. Now we can go over to questions and answers from the audience. Okay. So if you have any questions you would like to ask Enrique, you're welcome to do that. The microphone to each person. Okay. Uh, yes, I am wondering uh, whether we could do this in a group and our intention go to the to the people of the world or the society or anything and just just you know just between the family and friends but further is that possible to have, have, have some influence on the world today um it was difficult for me to to understand uh, can you Repeat the question, Tajay? Yes, I'm thinking of thinking, you know, you take, a, you um, see, you use it in a group. There's a system, what you just explained, we can use it in a group to meditate and to have intention to have influence on the world today. Do you think that's possible? Um, no, I think she is getting the microphone too close to her mouth, maybe. Oh, yes, oh, yes. I think what she's meaning is that with this approach that you suggested, combining the heart and the head, used also in a group 
that wants to influence world events, wants to have a positive, if this be used to make a positive impact on the world, not only contra extraterrestrials, but also our fellow human beings, uh, influencing them in a positive way. Is that correct? Definitely, yes. If we work from our heart all the time, uh, we are going to find a way to to create peace in the world. Um, it's like like this. The other day, I was with my my son in the pool, and before we enter the pool, we started exercising a little bit. My son is 15, but he cannot do the push-ups. And I'm like the master of the push-ups, so I was doing like 20, and my son was, I cannot do it. I don't have the training. I'm not a military guy like you, and I'm not either, but he was like... Um, and I was a little frustrated that he couldn't do it. Then I remember at some point he went out of the pool, and I was uh, meditating in the pool. And then I asked myself, um, why am I frustrated about this? I, I have to relax. And... Then I just breathe in and out, I connect again with my heart, and I remember that uh, to my mind came the, the image of my son when he was a baby. He was sitting on this couch and very smiley, happy, not doing anything, just in ecstasy. And then I realized from my heart that he doesn't need the push-ups in order to be happy and successful in his life. So why am I being so frustrated about, right? And it was uh, such an insight at the moment that I remember I went out of the pool and I told him, you don't need the push-ups, you're going to be happy. So just relax, nothing happened. And I think if we take the life from the brain, we need to succeed in every field. We need to push ourselves into getting something and... Is this moment what we should value? And to be in this moment, we need to be in the center of ourselves. And I think the heart is a key for that. So try to think more with the heart. Here in California, we have this institute called the Heart Math Institute. And they study the function of the heart. And they find out that this is the electromagnetic field the biggest electromagnetic field we have in our whole body, even bigger than the brain. We emit more energy from the myocardium in our heart than from the, the brain. I think electrically is like a thousand times stronger and magnetically I think is four thousand times stronger. So we should think and feel from here all the time. So yes, I think it will help us a lot in relationships, in in the planet, in creating peace and harmony in our lives. The, the alien beings said at some point that the most important contact is not the contact with them, but the contact within. When you contact with yourself, with your feelings, with your heart, then you're going to be ready to do the same with your neighbor. In the house to the side. Do you have a good relationship with your neighbor? Because if you don't, you cannot expect to have a good relationship with a person from another planet. Okay? You really need to look forward that friendship with all your fellow beings. It's not possible that you are in war with the humankind and you are so open to the alien beings. That doesn't happen. It doesn't work. So, yes, you need to think from your heart, all the time. All right, thanks. There are a lot of questions from all the other. I would like you to explain about the corn crop circles. What are they about? And what is their connection with the extraterrestrials? And what are they supposed to teach us? Is that about uh, promoting our ability to enter the fourth dimension? Um, I miss some of the words in the beginning. I would like you to sorry. I would like you to explain about the corn crop circles and the their, crop, circles. Uh, crop circles. Yes, and their relationship to the extraterrestrials, the UFOs, the way they are created, and why they are created, and why they are multiplied and um, 
and become more and more elaborate uh, the last few years. Is that about uh, developing mankind and supporting us uh, to enter the, the fourth dimension? Um, I think the crop circles, in a way, are uh, triggering some of the aspects of the four dimension, because some of the designs are like um, fractal mathematics. They are pointing to a four-dimensional mathematics that we don't have here, and their symmetrics, their geometry is is actually activating some aspects of our brain that we don't use, so inviting us to function in a different level of energy. So yes, I think crop circles are a language of energy that is inviting us as a whole, as a humankind, to, to think in a different way, to understand symbolically and energetically things that maybe we don't have access through our intellects only. So I think they are doing the job in that way, um, sad that we don't have that many crop circles here in, in America, but um, I think there are many different ways of communication and crop circles, I think, are one of those methods they use um, for an influence that is pacific. It's not an intrusion, it's just a form of, of art, I think, that is helping us to, to evolve to grow in consciousness. So yes, I think it's an invitation to experience the four dimension. When you are in front of a circle, of a crop circle, um, if you just analyze it in the terms of your intellectuality, you are missing the point. I think you should feel a crop circle. Or you should sit there and just uh, suck all the energy around you at that moment because that is opening a, a doorway for you into a different way of perception. And yes, I think it's the influence of alien beings. No doubt some humans are making some of the fake circles, but I'm sure there is an alien intelligence behind the, that initiative. Yes, I have no further. I know there was a lot of contacts to different planning groups in South America from um, the early 70s. I suppose you know your name brother Enrique Castillo Rincon in Bogota. Have you, do you know if the, your group, the Rama group, has any connection with the, the group of Rincon in Bogota? Uh, that was very difficult to understand. Terje, can you uh, repeat the question? that I know of. I didn't meet him in person and I'm sure Sixto Paz at some point um, shared uh, an audience with him in some conferences. Uh, from what I know of, uh, we are being visited by many different beings from many different um, origins and Rama is very specific in the sense of the, the guides that were assigned to this group. There are 49 people from the outer space that come from different places, Alpha Centauri, um, Ganymedes, and many other different uh, places. But uh, the experience of Castillo Rincón was not 
in the in the context of the Rama program of contact. Um, in Rama, we say that the contact is not just in this moment. It comes from the past. They create this program of contact like 5,000 years ago. And the experience of Castillo Rincón is something more of a contemporary uh, experience. So I know we share the, the idea of this uh, positive encounter with alien beings, positive intentions from them. Um, I think we share that, but uh, deeper into the context of the program of contact, I think we have a different path. Okay. Hello, um, I just want to say that I'm very concerned about the animal kingdom and I wonder if you have achieved any information or you could say something about uh, how uh, some, say something about how we should treat our brothers and sisters or sentient beings in the animal kingdom Okay. On the 21st of September 2012, I had an experience in, in Mount Shasta where I could meet some of these guides. And they talk about the beginning of the, the highest potential of the four dimension at that time, that specific date. And that was coincidental with the, <clears throat> the door of the sun that is in Tiahuanaco in, in Bolivia. And they say there was a marker of time that is pointing at a shift in, in consciousness. So humankind is entering the fourth dimension, but the animal kingdom is entering the third. So what is happening from that date and ahead is that we will see more and more that animals are going to start having behaviors that looks like human behaviors. You are going to notice more and more parrots, orangutans, and dogs, cats doing stuff that normally humans used to do. And and of course, that's because when humans advance, uh, civilizations that were above, they also advance. And uh, species that were below, they also advance into the next level. So it's not only us going through the fort, but all the species going with us in different directions. So yes, I think with a consciousness of four dimension, we need to be more aware of all the species we share this habitat. And we should become the protectors of this planet. But for that, we need to respect these creatures. And a way to do it is to stop eating them, right? Um, I don't think we need, do we need that much meat. Um, I know we can survive very well with with vegetables and and fruits. I, I'm not saying feed completely the the way you feed yourself. Um, I'm saying avoid the excess of meat, and in a way you are going for the peaceful approach to another species. It's the same. I was mentioned um, mean about peace with your neighbor. It's not just the neighbor that lives in the house to the side of yours. It's also the neighbor that lives in the dog house and all the species that, that you consider friendly in your environment. So yes, we should protect them. We should be aware of our responsibility towards them. And we should recognize that they have rights too. And I think we are evolving in that direction. Uh, hundreds of years ago, women were burned in the stake. They didn't have any rights. They were witches, right? 
And then in the 1950s, we have the civil rights and and now we have the same rights. And I think uh, African-Americans here in the United States and, and in many countries, we are becoming equal or recognizing that we were equal in the first place. At some point, we are going to realize the same about animals. They are a form of intelligence. Maybe not the intelligence of the way we work our brains, but they are intelligence and they deserve respect. And they have the same rights as we do in this planet. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I do agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I have a very different uh, question. A friend of mine is channeling from uh, a group he calls the Ashta Commando. Command, Ashta Command. Could you please share some information about this group? Okay, in the Rama network, we know there are federations of planets that have a protocol of uh, work with civilizations like ours. Uh, we know there is a, a command of beings, in this case Ashtar, that are working also. But I know there are many misunderstandings regarding his messages. I think many people take his name to give their own um, input, their own information. And I think we should be very delicate about uh, what we receive. Uh, with the Rama protocols, what we do is we ask for a confirmation. When we receive something telepathically, if I channel something, after I channel, if I'm not sure about the information, I would ask them, I need, please, uh, you to give me a, a sighting so I can confirm this information is right. So they tell me, Friday, 7 p.m., go out of your house and look at the sky. And I go out, I see the light is there, then that's a confirmation. If I go out and there is nothing there, or it's cloudy or whatever, that's not a confirmation. This thing doesn't work. So I have and goes to the trash. Okay? I'm telling you this because there are many misunderstandings regarding the Ashtar command. I'm not saying that it's not there. I'm sure Ashtar is doing his work. But uh, there are many people talking in his name, and that's not his information. Uh, I've seen Ashtar talking about the end of the world, talking about picking up a selected group of people outside of the planet. All those things are lies. They don't think like that. So be very careful about that and look for affirmations. Don't just feed yourself with whatever they give you because most of the time it comes from our level of consciousness and that doesn't work for what we are... Uh, Pointing to is to uh, the next level. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I understand, I think I understand what you're talking about, that it's a lot of abuse around the world of uh, the name of the Ashta command. Uh, I've only heard uh, channelings from my friend who I've known for very many years. Uh, I respect him a lot. And everything he channels is very, very beautiful. And it's a lot of love and high spiritual teachings, but I, I know we need to be aware. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I think we finished up the session. Now everybody has had the questions they wanted. Then we thank you very much for a very interesting interview with you, Enrique. Thank you, Jack, for the invitation. I am very glad that my voice is there. And uh, at some point, we will have these devices uh, for teleportation, and I'm going to be able to be there and then here. Too. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot.